And we're going to go forward into our life series. And if you haven't been with us, we've been doing this series the last several weeks about a marriage and family and parenting. We've talked about a lot of different things. And I told you guys, I didn't want to leave all the people in the room that were not married. I didn't want to leave you out of this. Um, so I'm going to, to go into this this morning. I want to take you back to that foundational verse real quick. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. And this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, everybody say practice, right. is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Listen to me. It had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. I wanted to read that again. We read that for the first three weeks of this series, and I wanted to read it again to remind those of you that are in this room and those of you that are watching online, if you are married or not married, foundation is key. Now, the great thing for those of you guys that aren't married, you get to start the foundation at the right point, at the right place. And you are at a place right now where you need to put serious work into the foundation of your life so that you can move forward into what God has for you. And for the rest of you, listen to me, um, some of you guys, your foundation was built with untreated wood. Come on. It was solid for a little bit, but it didn't have what it needed on the inside of it to keep, to make it last. And so some of the things that I'm going to listen, I, and I, I hope that you guys will hear me. There are three facets to today's message. Number one, those of you that are single, those of you that are not married, obviously that's priority. Number two, those of you that are here that are already married, but these are not principles that you thought about leading into your marriage, today is the day that you've got to make a decision to make those things come to pass. And then number three, there are some deep spiritual principles into what I'm about to share with you. Um, we're going to talk today, about, I've titled the message, Single and Loving It. Come on, somebody. Single and Loving It. And all the married people said... Amen. <laughs> right? <laughs> Enjoy. Enjoy. Okay? Um, that it is possible. I know that the season of singleness, it feels like a curse, but it is possible for this season of your life to be something you actually love. Okay. So I'm going to poll the crowd real quick. Um, how many of you guys um, are married? Raise your hand. Come on, good job. How many of you guys are engaged? We have, we have some engaged couples in our church, but is there anybody in this service? Nobody engaged. Well, there's some work to be done, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. Some of y'all is looking at them going, yeah. Why can't I raise my hand right now? Um, so, or number three, how many of you guys are dating somebody? Raise your hand if you're dating somebody. There you go. All right, these are the ones you can't be with, Okay. How many of you would say it's complicated? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You ain't got to raise your hand for that one. But there's a lot of different groups of people here today. Um, I'll say this, even though, because I, I just made a statement and made me think about it. I, I know I just said that there's some deep spiritual principles. I think that on the surface today, it's going to come across very simple. And I think sometimes when, when let me say it this way. Some people say it's not deep because it's clear <laughs> or because you understand it. So I think sometimes in the church, um, we want things to come across from the pulpit where we don't even understand them because then we feel like they're deep because we don't understand them. That's, that's the opposite of what, the way that the word should be. The word should be something that we get understanding from. And so I will tell you that it's going to seem like it's not very deep because it's going to be something I think that we've written down and, and are able to communicate in such a way that you're going to actually be able to understand it because church people just want to spend their life confused, I've decided. They would rather be confused and feel deep than understand and feel simple. And so today it may come across as simple. Why are we, why are we talking a whole message 
for those, of the, for those people in here that are single. Now, we're going to talk about the sexuality part of it next week. Um, we're going to shift, and that's going to be for married and for single. This is going to be both parties. So I'm not going to address sexuality with the singles today. Why is this important? Why are we doing this? Number one, I will tell you I'm doing this because I really want you to get it right the first time. It's that important to me. I really want you to get this thing right. My goal today is that you're not going to want to date, but that you are going to want to get married. And that'll make more sense later. Number two, the second reason we're doing this is because right now is your present. And one day your present will become your past and your past is going to show up in your future. And you can take this from me. I'm somebody who can tell you a great deal about that. Tons of married people in this room right now. You desperately wanna say amen to that right now because nobody ever told you that. Nobody ever told you that your right now is one day going to be your past and your past is gonna show up again in your future. You weren't ever told that and I want you to know that every decision that you make right now, it does matter. Um, one thing that I've learned in my life is that people do not know how to focus on the season that they are in. Now this is one of those deep spiritual principles. This is not only about being single. People do not know how to focus on the season that they find themselves in. Why? Because they're always trying to look ahead into what's next. I'm, I'm the worst at this. I'm a visionary. I'm not an in-the-moment guy. That's, that's, not my, that's not the way that my mind works. That's not the way that I think. I'm a visionary. I'm the one that's already thinking about what we're going to do next before we've even done what we're doing well or before we've even completed it. That's just the way my mind works. And, and there are so many people that are single, as, as we talk about this subject in particular, they are so focused on looking at the next season, they're not managing the season they're in well. And listen, listen to me, and this is across the board. This is not only about being single, this is a kingdom principle. If you do not learn how to strengthen what remains in the season you're in, if you don't know how to utilize the season that you're in, you will always be looking ahead into the next season and going into what's next without getting what you were meant to get out of what was before. And listen, when you go into the next season without getting what you were supposed to get in the season before, you are going into the next season unprepared. That's good. It's a good word. That's a good principle for you to understand. You've got to learn how to maximize every season that you find yourself in, whatever it is, no matter how difficult, no matter how uncomfortable, and no matter how much you want to get to that next season, you still have to find the way because every season matters. Every season has a purpose. That's why God tells Noah in Genesis 8, or, or Genesis, I think Genesis 12, no, Genesis 8. In Genesis 8, he tells him what? He says, there will always be, and he lists the seasons. Times of harvest, times of sowing. There will always be the times of night and the times of day. And he tells them through, he goes through all of these different seasons. He says, that's the, that's the reason why. It's because every season has a purpose. Every season has a purpose. And what happens is, 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 is we try to push people through their seasons, don't we? You know, I, there's a preacher that sang this in a sermon years ago, and I, I've sang it before when I've talked about relationships and stuff, is we all heard our first sermon on the kindergarten playground about marriage and family. We all did. That first sermon went like this. Um, he, uh, now I don't remember how it starts. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. How does it start? John and Tiffany sitting in a tree. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. Sing it with me. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Tiffany with the baby carriage. That's not all. That's not all. Here comes John drinking alcohol. Right? That's, that's the sermon. That's where you learned about marriage and family. Right there. You learned that the seasons go like this. Kiss. Love, marriage, baby, alcoholic. <laughs> That's the system. And, and we really, when we, when, we, when we think about our childhood, we think about the movies that we watched as children. We think about the, 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 the focus on love and finding that true love and 
especially when we were growing up in the old Disney movies. I mean, that was the theme of every Disney movie. And so it was finding that first love. And when we think about the songs that we sing and think about what culture teaches us, and isn't it true that everyone tries to push you into that next season? Because for those of you guys that aren't dating anybody, what's the question you get more than anything? Why aren't you dating anybody? What's wrong with you? You can't find nobody. Nobody wants you, right? And then if you are dating somebody, and especially if you're dating somebody for an extended period of time, and especially if you're dating somebody for an extended period of time, and you're in your early 20s to 50s, what's the question you get all the time? When you get married, they're pushing you into that season. And then when you get married, what's the first thing? You walk down the altar and go back to have cake. First thing, when y'all gonna have kids. Can we have a little bit of time, please, by ourselves? Can we enjoy this for a few years? I mean, it is. It's everybody's trying to push you into that next season. But you've got to learn how to get the most and maximize out of every season that God blesses you with. And listen, singleness is a season. I'll come back to that. I don't want to say that. Um, You can be successful in your singleness. People feel like, If they're single, they're a failure. That's what people feel like. That is not true. I'm gonna prove it to you with scripture. People say, I just wanna be married. And then you go around and you think about it and you talk about it and uh, always a bridesmaid, never a bride. And you do this. But here's the crazy thing. Let me tell you something for all you single people. All you single people that think all I want is to be married, what you don't realize is that married people in this room go, all I want is to be single. (laughs) So listen, the grass is not greener on the other side, Okay. Um, they, they, both seasons carry complications. Come on, married people. Let's be real. They both carry sets of complications. And so we want to make sure that we understand that we don't rush through these seasons. Let me give you three points today for all the single people. And again, I want you to think about these. If you're married, I want you to think about whether or not you need to work on this now. And if you are married or single, I want you to think about the kingdom principles I'm about to share with you. These are much deeper than just this one subject. I mean, much deeper. Number one, singleness is not a curse. It is a God-given season. We just talked about this. Genesis chapter one, starting in the beginning. Genesis chapter one, verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Look at what it says. Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that who? That they, somebody say they. They. Isn't that interesting? The first thing that we see is God designed humanity is there was already a they even though he didn't start with a they. Isn't that interesting? He didn't create Adam and Eve at one time. He created Adam. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you some of the things that I believe about the timetable and the chronology of Genesis. You don't have to agree with me, but I'm gonna show you the way that I read this. But the Bible definitely says, regardless of what you feel about the creation narrative and how it played out and what happened on what days and everything, regardless, you can see that God created Adam alone. And that's why God looked down at him and said, it's not good for man to be alone. So God's intention was always that there would be a they, but it did not start with a they. The seasons that God has for us don't always start like they will end, okay? You need to understand that that there are people that stress out so much about whether or not they are a they. Don't stress about the they. God's got the they. That's not for you. You trust God with the they, That's what they had, that's what Adam has to do. So then we switch over to chapter two now. Let's go to the next chapter, Genesis two, verse seven. It says, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden and there he put the man he had formed and the Lord God had made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and very good for food. In the middle of the garden, there was the tree of life and the tree of the, of, of the knowledge of good and evil. Skip down to verse 15. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. The Lord God put who? The man, not they. He put the man in the garden 
of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will surely die. Notice what it says, when you eat from it. God's grace was on the front end of the whole fall. He says, if you eat this tree, this is what's gonna happen. And when you eat it, (laughs) I'm here. That's what he's letting them know. We see that God creates man here alone. He he creates man by himself. We saw in in chapter one that God already knew that, that it was going to be a they But he also knew that it was not good for man to be alone, so he created Adam alone. Why did he create Adam alone? Because the single season, listen to me, write this down. And if you're married, you need to listen to me as well. The single season is the time of becoming, not looking. Mm. The dating websites love when preachers say this. How many of you married people had seasons where you really focused on becoming? Because if you didn't have that season, you need to start that season right now. Because a lot of us, all we ever did was we were looking. We were looking. Looking for that one. I hear people say all the time, they'll say, I'm looking for the right person. That is the wrong mentality. That is the wrong mindset. We have got to stop looking for the right person and we've got to start trying to become the right person because the season of singleness is not a season where I'm meant to just look it is meant to be a season where I'm actually saying okay what do I need to become to attract the right person see many of you are looking for the right person but the right person don't want you because you ain't become the one they want And then you wonder why you've ended up with who you ended up with. And some of the people that are dating are looking at each other going. He ain't talking about us. He ain't talking about us. I'm I'm, I'm happy with you. I'm happy with you. So many people believe that the right person is going to fix them. (laughs) Listen to me. The right person is not going to fix you. You are inverting the order. The right person is not going to fix you. There's only one person that can fix you, and his name is Jesus. And that is why this single season of your life needs to be a time where you focus fully on him because Jesus can repair. Jesus can mend broken places. Jesus can heal the hurt of your life. Before you ever go into that relationship, God says, I want to do a work in your life, but if you're not focusing on me in this season and you're spending, some of you are looking more for your mate than you are your savior. You're looking more for the one that you think is gonna complete you in the world rather than the one that can complete you out of heaven. And I'm telling you, you've got to change your focus. Scripture does not teach me a lot about how to find the right person. But Scripture teaches me a great deal of how to become the right person. There's a reason for that because this season matters to God. Again, you might not be the right person for the right person. And that's why you always attract losers. Okay? But if you would just come to God and step into his plan and his purpose for your life and all that he has for you as a single person, then you will become the right person for the right person. And what's beautiful is is you will actually be repulsed by anybody that is not the right person if you would become the right person. See, I'm a believer in the law of attraction, I really do. The law of attraction says that you attract who you are, not what you want. And everybody said, oh, <laughs> that is not good. I have people all the time, they say, I want a funny guy. And it's because they have no joy. And funny people don't wanna be around you because you're not fun. And you think that funny person is going to fix you. People say, I want an ambitious person. And you are the laziest human walking around. 
And that's why you want an ambitious person. I want a rich man. And you ain't even got a job. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Men, I want a girl with a good body. And you ain't worked out a day in your life. <laughs> because we're trying to think that if we get these people into our life, they'll fix me. Here's one of the biggest ones. I want a, I want a good Christian and you don't even go to church. <laughs> you can't ask the Lord to send you something that you think is gonna fix you. You've gotta become what that one's looking for. You want a believer? You better fall in love with Jesus, okay? You better fall in love with Jesus. Man had two things in this season that mattered for this single season. Number one, if you wanna write this down, this isn't on the screen, I'm just telling you. He had to learn to live in relationship with God. That was the first priority of the single season, to be in relationship with God. Because, listen to me, anybody here that's not married, you are single, but you are not alone. You are not alone. There is a relationship that you've been called into and this single season, the reason this season matters is because you need a season alone with the Lord where you're not distracted in your relationship. You've got to fall in love with him first. People find, you, you've seen this, we've all seen this, people find their identity in a significant other. But I am here to tell you that a significant other will never make you somebody. Only a savior can make you somebody. A person will never make you be successful. It is only Jesus that can make us successful. And we've got to learn that we have to find that relationship first. No one out there, listen to me, no one out there will ever fulfill the longing in your life. That void is there between you and your father. Jesus will be the one that fulfills that void. And then secondly, the second thing he had in this season of singleness was to find purpose and be productive. You need to learn to do this before you're married because as I've already taught you in marriage, that's why I told you single people, listen to these sermons because one of the keys to marriage success is cultivation. And if I don't know how to work and be productive before I get into marriage, that is not the kind of on-the-job training I want. I want to already know how to do these things. You should be productive for God. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, listen to this. It says, and the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no helper was suitable, um, no suitable helper was found. It, it, this is crazy because the Bible says that, that God gives Adam, before he gives him a woman, he gave him a job. He says, I want you to name every animal on the planet. Now, I know y'all learned about this in Sunday school with flannel graph. And y'all put the giraffe up there and y'all stuck the giraffe on the flannel graph board. Y'all said, and Adam said, this is a giraffe. And everybody said, woo. And then you put the monkey up there and y'all say, Adam said this is going to be a monkey. Woo. And you put three or four animals up there and that's the way you left it in Sunday school. Was, there was a few, he named a giraffe and he named a monkey and he named a cow and he did these. Yeah, he did all. He named every animal on the planet before Eve was ever created. Think about this. How long would that take? When we talk about Jacob working seven years, come on, listen, I don't know if you've ever studied Darwinism, but Charles Darwin on the Galapagos Islands, he found a microcosm of an already existing species of bird, and it took him years to name that microcosm of a species that already existed. How long would it have taken Adam to name every animal on the planet? 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years? We don't know. But I believe that it was an extended period of time that Adam was by himself 
doing the work and the purpose of his father, learning how to cultivate the garden, learning how to obey the word of his father in heaven so that when the suitable, the people say, oh, there was no suitable helper found. I believe the reason that God did this is he was really saying, Adam's not ready for the suitable helper yet. He's got to get this purpose and this plan of God into action of his life. Listen, if you're single, I'll tell you this. If you're single, the single season, season should be the funnest time you serve the Lord. And let me tell you why. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32. It says, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, but how can he please the Lord? A married man is concerned about the affairs of this world. How can he please his wife? Come on, man. They said it long before you said it. I can't please her. It says, and the interests are divided. Listen, the interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world. How can she please her husband? I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in the right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. We have to have a season of our life of undivided devotion to the Lord. It is needed. It is necessary. Let me ask you a question. Those of you that are in the room right now and you are not married, are you living an undivided life and devotion to the Lord? Are you spending your time looking? Because this season, Aaron, one of the things that impressed Aaron over in, in Central America, and you know, when you take people over, this was their first mission trip with us, and never been over, and when you take people, it's always something to, to hear what they are amazed by because there's so many things that you see and experience that are just eye-opening, and one of the things that Aaron was talking about was how the church was, is their life, and especially the single people. They're, they're, they're going to church every night of the week, every night. They're getting there early to set up chairs and they're getting there early to set up sound because they can't leave anything out because they'll get robbed. And it's, it's these single, we, we were surrounded this whole week by several single people in the church that were fully devoted to the Lord. And Aaron said over and over and over, it's amazing how dedicated and devoted they are to the church. And listen, for some of us in this room, it's hard to even read the Bible every day or to pray every day. And the Lord is telling us here, he says, I'm telling you that this single season of your life is really important because this is the time where you are undivided and devoted to the Lord. Because let me tell you something, when you get married and start dating, you ain't got your own money. It's divided. You have to think differently. Let me tell you something, when you're, all, when, when you're married, you, men, you don't get to decorate, do you? Come on, somebody. You don't get that option, right? Because it's divided. Well, it ain't divided. She gets the option, but when, when you get married, it ain't just your debt. It's their debt. Everything's divided, and all of a sudden, everything in your life, you think differently about it. You go out to eat, and your wife looks at it and says, oh, that looks good. And then you say, then you should have ordered it. Because Joey doesn't share food. Right? But everything's divided. You need a season where you are fully devoted to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Number two. I gotta, get, I gotta get through these next two real quick. Success and singleness means you allow longing and appreciation to build up for the mate God has for you. Now, this is a kingdom principle. This is not just about singleness. This is about everything the Lord has for us. You need to understand that it is important that you have seasons of your life where God allows a longing to build up for what he has for you. Are you with me? Does that make sense? And I'll tell you what we're gonna do. We're gonna end on this one. I'm gonna roll this. The next point can be rolled into the, the sex talk next week. 
So that will be no problem. We're gonna end right here because I'm not gonna rush through this because this is a big kingdom principle. The Bible says that God looks down to man and says it's not good for man to be alone, to which I would go, then give me a woman. Right? Doesn't that make sense? If God looks down and says it's not good for man to be alone and then tells me after that, but name all the animals first. Take care of the garden first. There is a season that that doesn't make a lot of sense in our minds of, okay, God, if I need this, then why aren't you giving this to me right now? Because there is a season that God withholds what he has for us so that it creates a longing so that when we finally get it, we value it and we appreciate it and we do not squander it. Because the Bible says, after God says, it's not good for man, man to be alone, it goes on in verse 21, it says, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. And I would tell you this, listen to me, If you will allow God to do the work on the inside, he will pull out of you from the work that he's doing inside of you. Good word, John. And this is for everything. This is for your relationships. This is for every part of your life. If you will allow God to do the inside work, he will pull out of you from that inside work what he wants to bless you with. Jesus will not fulfill every longing of your life, but Jesus will fulfill every longing in your life because he pulls from within the work that he's doing on the inside of me. Verse 22, then the Lord God made woman from the rib and that he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Now again, you don't have to agree with me chronologically. But I believe that this took place over many years because of the way that it's written in the Hebrew in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. I do understand that Genesis 1, when it does the creation narrative, it talks about God creating male and female on the sixth day. But in the original language, if you look at it, it is basically making a statement that God created mankind, which is what God named both of them on the sixth day. And then after it says that God created mankind, it goes into the whole male and female. He created them as an afterthought to the fact that God created Adam on the sixth day. I I do not believe that God created Adam and Eve at the same time because again, there's too much context here to be given about what Adam had to do while he was waiting on Eve to get there. But when Adam finally sees her, whether it's a a year or 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years, again, this, this this is back before the garden had the fall. We don't understand how any of this was in operation. But however long it was, when Adam sees her for the first time, um, after that season of singleness, the first time he sees her, he uses this ancient form of poetry called parallelism. That's why it says bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This is the first time that we see this in scripture where where Adam uses parallelism. But, But what it really was is Adam was breaking out into a song. As soon as he saw her, can you feel the love tonight? Right? I mean, he just broke out right there. Why did he break out? Why did this happen? This is not a coincidence. This this is a picture of what worship looks like on the inside of a believer. Because in these seasons where God allows us to go through seasons where he says, it's not good for you to remain where you are, but I'm going to allow you to remain where you are for a little while longer. Because if I allow you to stay where you are a little while longer, when it finally comes and when you finally get access to what I actually have for you, you are going to have more appreciation and you are going to have more thanksgiving in your heart and you are not going to squander it and you're not going to blow it and you're not going to waste it. That's what God is doing here. He says it led Adam into a place of worship with the Lord because that longing had built up on the inside of him. It amplified that longing. I had to work for this, Adam said. I've always said, I give my wife this credit. 
My wife allowed a longing to be built up. My wife, for those of you guys who don't know, I was her only boyfriend ever. I was, I was the only one that she ever dated. I wasn't her only kiss. But I am very grateful in all sincerity. I'm very grateful that my wife had a much healthier season than I did. But because what I did is I went through transactional relationship over after uh, one after another, after another, after another. And listen to me, if you continue in relationships that are simply transactional, you never allow the Lord to build up any longing for what he has for you. And you will never appreciate it. When, when, when Adam sees Eve for the first time, Adam goes, man, I waited 20 years for you. I waited 50 years. I worked for you. I've been naming the animals for God. And then Adam goes, do you think I'm gonna mess this thing up now? Heck no. See, that's the problem. That's, that's why so many marriages are on such shaky ground. You never really gave God to give you a real longing for it anyway. Because you were in relationship after relationship after relationship. You were never alone enough to long for what is right. And you never had the opportunity to appreciate what God gave you. For those of you that aren't married, listen to me. There's a they. But allow God to build that desire up on the inside of you. So that when you find it, you won't miss it. You won't squander it. You won't blow it. And again, this is for everything that God has for us. This is not just about relationship. This is about everything that God has for us. Dad, if you wanna come on up and if, if you guys wanna stand up this morning, we're, we're gonna stop right there.